you do so. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Hopefully your equipment is a Bible. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, and we <clears throat> are going to be dealing with verse 9. But to really <clears throat> understand verse 9, that's my wife's phone, I'm sure. But before we really get into verse 9, we need to realize that it begins with the word and. And the word and is a conjunction that is tying two thoughts together. <clears throat> and so we'll read verse 9, but we want to see where it comes from out of verse 8. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. All right, so um, you, you see the basic premise of verse 9, but you have to realize that verse 8 is where it came from. So let's read verse 8. For God is my witness, how greatly I long after you, after you all, in the bowels of Jesus Christ, or the tender mercies of Christ, or the tender heart of Christ. <clears throat> and this I pray, that your love. So what he's stating in verse 8 is he's stating what's at work inside of him. He's, he's beginning <clears throat> by uh, first... You know, the first couple of verses, he talked about the different relationships that many people have with God. But then he starts talking about this experience when he was there, when he was in Philippi, when he was in their city for the first time, and he led them to the Lord, and he, he claims... <clears throat> that these incidences surrounding his imprisonment were not just for the gospel. They were not just for the gospel. They were for the release of Christ through him for the benefit of others. Not... not I can't tell you how important that is compared to what most people say. Because most Christians, we have these generic ways of, of talking. Well, I'm going to serve Jesus. And then there's no, real, there's no real commitment to that. It's just somehow I'm going to serve Jesus. Well, that's not according to the Word of God. Where there is a commitment of heart, not just of will. <clears throat> but we say... Um, that um, uh, I am suffering for the gospel's sake or I went through what I went through for the gospel's sake. Well, there's a certain amount of truth of that, but you have to realize that for Paul, the gospel was Christ in him and Christ crucified and him in Christ. That the gospel was wrapped up in reality and not doctrine. In reality and not uh, surface um, uh, phrases and idealisms that have no real uh, pressure on your life, but basically you become a Christian by changing terminology. By the way, Welcome back, Jennifer. <clears throat> and there is the happiest man of all. <clears throat> and so um, he, he has begun, because he's, he's only just begun to explain this whole thing about 
what he went through, that, that he literally went to jail so that he could release Christ into this city so that from that, others would get life out of his death or, or, or reign out of his suffering or gain out of his loss. And that he's, he just stated that in verse 7, and now he's saying, and God is my witness, how strongly I have longed after you. And you could even say, you, who are you talking about there? Because when he was there, he spent more time in jail than he did getting to know people. But he knew the you that he was talking about, meaning the church that has now been raised up there was sure to come. As surely as there was a night, there was going to be a day. As surely as there was a death, there was going to be a resurrection. And he knew it, and he knew it, and he's speaking to them as a result. Not just, he's not just talking to the church at Philippi. He knows that they were birthed out of his self-giving out of his loss. He knows that with all of his being. And so he has stated that in verse 7, that you have become partakers of my grace. <clears throat> and then he just says the, the, the uh, dynamo, the engine that's on the inside of his car and on the inside of his being that brought all this about. Because, folks, you can know, you can know ideals, you know, uh, you, can, you can know um, concepts of God. You can call it doctrines. You can call it theology. You can know all of that and not have the dynamo that produces any of it. Well, the dynamo that produces it is or Jesus. Or Jesus Christ, or, or the Lord, or, but, but so he's he's been stating if you if you put Paul here, I think I'm going to have to move this chair. If you put Paul here, and you take verse seven and eight outside over here, verse seven, and well, let's just go with verse seven, where he's he's just talking about this. You could say he's talking, now he's not, he's not teaching theology here. He's not. He's talking about what he believes and what he went through based on his beliefs. Does that make sense? I mean, that this, is, this isn't just theology to him. He believes this, and what, what, what he is stating out of verse 7 is that, that he, well, let's just, let's just call it selflessness. as demonstrated by prison for others, suffering. All right. So he's, he's really stating a basic concept that I am not the, the center of the universe, that I am here to give myself for you so that you might have life. So I do that selflessly, and the manner in which I did it in this case was prison and suffering and all that so that you might become a partaker. And it's interesting because he, verse 9 is going to prove what he wants them to become a partaker of, but he calls it a partaker of my grace, okay, of his grace. Now. That's verse 7 where he's, he's, you know, you could, you know, do you understand how you can wrap up verse 7 in a little bundle and call it the bundle of selflessness, the ideal, the concept of selflessness, and really not understand that God's not just wanting people in general to be selfless. Buddhists tend to live selflessly. There are people that are not even following religions, but they live selflessly in certain ways. 
He's not advocating selflessness. He's advocating what verse 8 shows the, the dynamo, the thing that produces selflessness, the thing that will cause, will, um, let's put it like this, the thing that will take advantage of opportunities like death or prison will not be destroyed by them, but will take, because most people see those kind of things, suffering and all that, they see it as just the devil or bad luck or something. Something to be, something to avoid. Paul saw it as an opportunity to manifest selflessness as known in verse 8. And that selflessness is, we'll just we'll just call it the heart of Jesus because the heart of Jesus is selfless. But don't misunderstand it is Jesus. But it's not Jesus in heaven. It's not Jesus sitting on a throne somewhere. It's Jesus living on the inside of him, and that's what he says, for God is my witness. Why? Why would he choose God? Number one, because God is going to notice if it's Jesus. And contrary to that, God will notice if it's you, if it's just you. He didn't put Jesus in you to get more of you. Right? He, did, he could have saved you without putting Jesus in you, couldn't he? couldn't he? Couldn't he come down, die on a cross, go back up, and not enter into us, not come in as our life. Oh, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Why come into us? Because the only dynamo, the only engine that's got gas in it is Jesus. And his life within us is the definition of selflessness. In other words, again, and so very important, just being self-giving and selfless in itself is not enough. We'll see that, and it'll, it'll bear this out in a few scriptures down, but, but just important to see that. <clears throat> So he says, God is my witness how greatly I long after you. Okay, now in verse 7, he has expressed the, the, the degree that it took him in expressing that longing after that. Do you understand what I mean by that? that he went to prison, that he suffered, that he, he went through all sorts of hardships so that they could come forth with new life in Christ. Okay? He's showing the degree that he longed after them. But now, in verse 8, he's expressing the means. What it you know, how he brought it about, not just what, but how. You know, a lot of times we ask questions, and we ask what, but we don't ask how. Or take it to the next step and ask who. Because it's by, that's what verse 8 is stating here. It is by the tender mercies of Jesus Christ that dwells within him. And this is the this is the turn that he's making from the other uh, verses where God could be over here and quote unquote give you peace or God could be up there and uh, you could pray to him or you know he could be you know anywhere and you could thank him. But Paul is getting down to the issue. 
the issue to him ultimately is not what he does, but by whom it is done, or who, I don't know. By whom it is done. Okay. All right. But again, make no mistake. You can't separate the who from the how, or, what, or the what, I mean, the, the who from the what. Because if it's Christ, he manifests in a certain way, in a certain specific way. Again, Paul's beating around the bush still, and will for the rest of this chapter, in the sense that he hadn't shown you the, the exact manner of this thing. He's only given you the parts. He's given you the pieces. He's, he's, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul is handing them pieces in chapter 1 to a puzzle. And in chapter 2, he's going to take them and start putting them all together. Say, so now, see, this, is, this, is, this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here. And he's going to show us the living Christ, not the faraway God. The living Christ. The one that not just lives on a throne or in, you know, you know, a planet called heaven or, a, you know, a galaxy called heaven or a constellation, whatever, but lives in us and, and lives in us in a certain way. So, now, you followed along pretty good. It's, it's important that we, we took those steps because verse 9 is totally premised on what the, he said up to this point. So, he says in verse 8, how greatly I've longed after you, in verse 7, by giving myself in this way, this longing comes not from me, but the bowels or the tender mercies of Christ that is within me. Now, verse 9, and this I pray, that your love, do you see the turn? He's made the turn from himself to them. He's made the turn from describing what he went through in this selflessness, which comes by the heart of Jesus who dwells in him. Now he says, like, like he does in almost all of his letters, all of the epistles in the New Testament that Paul wrote, he adds a prayer. He does it over and over and over. Ephesians 1, 17, 8, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. And he's talking to Christians, and he's, he's so desirous that Christ be known by Holy Spirit revelation and not by just teaching or reading, but that when we read our Bible, we do two things. We say, I want to know my Bible. I think that's a good thing. I, I never think it's a bad thing to read your Bible to know the Bible. But I think it's always important that you, ta you, you tack on to that. I want to know you, Lord, by revelation. I want to know you. I'm not doing this to become a Bible scholar. I am doing this. I am pursuing you. I am you know, going to church or I'm in Bible school or, or whatever because I want to know you and in knowing you have you revealed in me in such a manner that it is no longer I that live but Christ. It's no longer my thoughts. It's no longer my ideas. It's no longer my plans. It's no longer my way. It's no longer my good deeds. It's no longer my selflessness. It's Christ. It's Christ. And that's got to be the heart. I mean, that's got to be the heart. And it's got to be something that you never let go of. We talked about the compass last week, didn't we? 
talked about hitting that compass and you know and having it where no matter how hard it is hit and how much spinning it does and I think it's Ben and I were talking about this or somebody and you, you know you can hit a compass and it can just spin quote unquote out of control but because it's a true compass that compass is not out of control it is spinning, waiting for the momentum of the hit to leave so that it can point back to Jesus. Any of you ever been hit by the enemy or circumstances or, you know, where you were just reeling? Um, I've sort of learned over the years, number one, when it happens, don't say anything too early. I usually uh, you judge nothing before the time because in truth, most of the time, we don't know what we're going through. We think it's one thing. We think it's a devil or we think it's this or that. But just to wait uh, because it's always healthy and it always pays off down the road where you don't have to go back and clean up the mess that you made. And number two, to, um, to wait in faith to wait in faith um, not just to wait <laughs> well what do you what do you mean wait in faith the true power of my compass to point in the right direction if you really think about it the compass itself is Christ in our heart I mean, if you, if you, because he's the only one, or the Holy Spirit, or whatever, Holy Spirit points to Jesus. Jesus points to the Father. We don't have that innately within us. It comes by receiving Christ and, and nurture, letting him be nurtured in us. You know, you just don't get a lot of that nurturing as, as what the Bible calls nurturing. You don't get that in church. You get that in the, the trial or in the situation. That's where you find that you've been hit and, uh, you know, it's been spinning and then it ends up pointing, your compass ends up pointing back to the Lord again. Okay, the first time, well, I didn't know that was going to end up, or we think it's just a miracle, or we think it, we give it credit somewhere other than Jesus. Then next time, well, you know, some of us are quicker than others. Some, after like four or five times, we go, you know what? This is Jesus in me. This is, the, this is his heart at work in me because I would have flaked out. Okay? Some of us, it takes like 40, 50 times. And one day we go, you know, I don't know why I've been worrying over the last 20 years. <laughs> but in the sense of not waiting patiently in faith that the Lord's going to bring me back around. The Lord's going to, after this thing's over with, I will be pointing towards the Lord again. And you learn to trust that once you've been through it. No amount of teaching is going to put that in you. You know what I mean? You might hear it. The Holy Spirit might bring it to your remembrance. And he does. But it's only in the situation where you begin to find the living God. You begin to find that Jesus is not just real in heaven or real in church. He's real in you. He's real in you. All right, so Paul knows he's real in him. The proof of that's verse 7 and 8. Now verse 9, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So the first thing, and we already just slightly mentioned it, Paul's prayer. Uh, it, when I was in Bible school, when I was a Bible school student, I decided to do a study on the prayers, the New Testament prayers, not 
the Gospels or the book of Acts, but like in the epistles. And I went through and I noticed several things that I'd never realized. I mean, I, I took them all and I, you know, wrote them all down and I examined them and everything. And w one of the things I noticed was in most cases, they are addressed to the Father in the name of Jesus, not addressed to Jesus. I found that to be extremely interesting because most people pray to Jesus instead of in the name of Jesus to God. And so, of course, seeing that, I went, why is this the case? You know, why? And eventually, the Holy Spirit taught me that it's because Jesus is our life. And Jesus goes to the Father. Amen. Jesus goes to the Father. And so when I would say, you know, and Jesus said, when you pray, pray this. Are you, are you teaching that now? Are you on the Our Father part? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus says, Our Father. He didn't say, My Father. And you guys are children of the devil. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, Our Father. When he rose from the dead, he said, I go to our, my Father and your Father. We must be in the family. The resurrection must mean more than saved from hell. My God, we're in the family. But more than that, we have Jesus' Father because we're in Jesus. That was a pretty big roach. When you pray, Jesus said. Well, when do you pray? Well, I don't know, but whenever you do, <laughs> say our Father. Don't say Jesus. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name meaning, you know. I mean, you know, if you go down to the bank and you want to sign a check, you know, and you say, okay, and you put your name on that check, but you're not married, that, but that's your boyfriend's account. They say, well, this ain't the right name. Well, he's my boyfriend. Well, I don't care what he is. Uh, this is the wrong name. You know. <clears throat> but if you're married, you're one, you do everything in that name, and it's all covers, it covers everything, you know, covers everything. Well, for some of you, some of you husbands don't have anything, like me. But in Jesus' name, we have access to everything. Why didn't it just say you have everything? Because it does. It says you have access. Why does it say you have access? Because you have to exercise faith in union. You have to. You have to. And this is why you exercise faith in waiting. You don't just wait. You go, well, the storm will be over someday. Things are going to be over eventually. No, you wait in faith. <clears throat> and this I pray. So it's just really, really important uh, if you study Paul's prayers to grasp that he never prays the way we pray. He's always praying in conjunction to reality. God's reality, not our reality. We go, Lord, you know, you know, bless my dog and fix this and do that and all this kind of stuff. And we know from verse two through six that we have, we, you know, that's okay to relate to him that way. But Paul is saying, look, I'm trying to bring you into something more substantial. You know, it's kind of like eating 
popcorn instead of steak for dinner, you know? And he's going, look, I'm trying to offer you steak here, and you're going, I, I like popcorn, you know? Well, good, but you can't live off of it. Man cannot live by popcorn law. <clears throat> and this I pray. I pray that your love... All right. <clears throat> now, I, I'm, I'm asking you in this class to particularly try to follow this, these phrases and sentences because they are totally building on one another. If you are doing that, then you would read verse 9 and say, This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. And you, and you would say, Where did that subject come from? I mean, you know, do you understand? Some, some of you maybe understand why I'm saying that. He, he, all of a sudden, why are you bringing up love? Well, I'll tell you why the average Christian thinks that, that he's bringing up love. Because it's just random Bible stuff anyway. It has nothing to do with the context. I mean, it does. I'm telling you what the average Christian thinks. Well, I'm going to change the subject now. Well, why? Well, just for no reason. I just thought I, I talked about that stuff. Now I want to talk about this. I want you all to hug more. You know, that's the way Christians look at it that your love abound more and more, you know. But the love that he's talking about here is, it, as it were, in comparison and contrast with what he's just described that he went through in, this, in terms of selflessness, in terms of suffering for others, not just suffering, not just, not just suffering, not just suffering for suffering's sake. There's, it's, that's called torture. That's not it. But to knowingly go down into death so someone else can come up in life or others can come up in life, that's love. How do you know? Well, let's see. Uh, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so you see this selfless giving. I mean, why didn't God just grab an angel? You know, hey, get down there and die on that cross for these people. I mean, you know, why didn't he, why didn't he uh, work it out where Abraham or you know, somebody else in the Bible, King David or somebody do this for him. Because when it comes to this spirit, you have to do it. And Paul knows that. And he cannot, cannot, cannot talk about what he has done for them without talking about the same thing being worked in them. I was thinking about it today, and I thought, you know, some people say, you know, don't be, you know, well, let's, let's, go, uh, let's go out on this outreach, or let's, you know, let's wash the dishes in there, mow the lawn, or something like that. Well, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm free. I'm free. I don't have to do that. I'm free. You know where I learned that from? me when I was in Bible school. Yeah. Yeah. They asked me to do some things. Well, I don't have to do that. I'm free. Praise God. I'm free. But what does Galatians say about that freedom? It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by love, serve one another. Okay, your freedom is now you are free from yourself. You are free to serve others. You are free from self-protection. 
God will raise you. God will protect you. And, and if he doesn't protect you, it's because you have chosen to be with him in death so that life will come out of death. For him to protect you makes him your benefactor. For you to go down into death with him makes you one that has received not only the benefit, but the spirit that gave it. And that's 1 John 3.16. By this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to. You know, I've often thought how big that word is going to be in, when we stand before God. Well, you know, well, you oughta, you shoulda, you know, you coulda by the Son. <clears throat> and so let's face it, no one, no one wants to suffer or go into death for others unless it comes by Christ. Because the truth is, without his nature, we are takers, not givers. We are takers. And we will take and take and take and take and take and take and take. And there are Christians that do that, and they have absolutely zero comprehension that God is not a taker. God is a giver. And that God wants us to conform to the image of Christ so that we will become givers. And I'm not just talking about money and finances and offerings. I'm talking about, you know, ways and means of manifesting that. <clears throat> Some of you may not know, but Bryce has recently got back from a Christian camp and just, you know, had a real good time there and a real good experience with the Lord and stuff. And <clears throat> so... Um, we were at the, some of you know the place where you ride the go-karts and stuff. We, we did it for my birthday a couple of years. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so he gets in there and he went, I mean, he's just like piling up the tickets. It's just amazing. On one little thing, they're just rolling out of there. And go, blah, 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 you know. So he gets all of those and then goes and gives them to Grace. And, you know, Grace comes back with, stuffed animal like this and a little uh, dolphin and about four or five other little things, all this stuff, you know. <clears throat> and you see when someone's heart has been grasped by Jesus, he's no, it's no longer about me. It's about others. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you care more for them. And, you know, Philippians is a really good book for all this. But I am telling you, I can go to Romans, I can go to Corinthians, I can show you all of the examples over and over of these things where Paul lives by a certain way and a certain means and a certain pattern. <clears throat> Pray that your love may abound. I am thankful that you became a partaker. Now I want you to become a giver. Isn't that great? And it is great. It's beautiful. Why? Because without Paul going into death, without him suffering, without him going through things, life can't come out, out of blessing. It comes out of self-giving. It comes out of death. So by doing that, there raises up this new church in, in Philippi, called the church at Philippi, and now they're saved, they're of God, they're going to church, they're reading the Bible, they're praying, they're going after God, and Paul says, okay, it's time for a change now. You've been the receivers for all this amount of time. I want, I'm praying, I'm praying for you that your love may abound more and more. You see that? You see the natural progression. And yet look at the interesting thing. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. All right. 
Let's make something absolutely clear here. He is not praying that they will have knowledge and judgment. He's not praying that they'll get more and 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 more knowledge and judgment. He's praying for more and more love to abound in their knowledge. That be that like a like a leaven that you put in in bread and it starts taking over your knowledge and your judgment. <laughs> Do you see it? It's right there. That your love may abound, not your knowledge, not your judgment. And he feels that the greatest increase, the greatest more and more, let me say it like this first, would be I want more and more of Jesus. I know I got him when I got saved, I want more and more. But then we have to be specific because Paul's being specific. That can be so generic that it never pushes us in any direction other than makes our little heart feel warm and we go, uh, you know, in a service or in a worship service, I want, I want more and more of Jesus and then walk out and then not pursue it, you know. Well, what he's talking about here is not saying more and more involvement in church. Now, it may be that. It may manifest in that way. You do understand that. It may manifest in more and more. It may, but it may not. It may not. It may, it, it, but it will manifest, and it will manifest in selfless acts of love. And when someone says, you're such a sweet person, you will say, it's not me. It's Jesus that lives in me. <laughs> You will acknowledge him because, you know, you will know this has come by life, not by law. This has come by Christ, not by commandment. This is his life at work in me. All right? So, make, make, making it clear here, yet more that it abounds in your knowledge in your judgment <clears throat> because it is possible to have a knowledge of the Lord that doesn't include any selflessness see a few people know that but apparently not everybody in this room knows that God doesn't want more selflessness. He wants more Christ. But if he gets more Christ, he's going to get more selflessness. If he gets more knowledge, what might you end up with? Self-righteousness? What? Pride? Arrogance. Arrogance. Good one. Ju judgments? I, I like that one. I like that one. Judgments. That's... Yeah, haughty spirit. But that's a good one because he says, I want, I want this love to abound more and more in knowledge and in your judgments so that there's more self-giving on your part instead of expectation on their part. Can I get an old me? <laughs> because that is the end result of this prayer. This prayer. That's where he's shooting for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, let's face it. Uh, I, I know of a situation right now that I'm in where someone has discerned problems with me and other people who really, really have done some terrible things, they don't discern anything wrong with them. So it's like, I don't know that our judgment, you know, I mean, our discernment isn't always good because we're not discerning by Christ, you know? And I'll just give a quick example. You look at Saul, King Saul, you know, he was taller. He was, so they wanted him to be king. 
And David, a little short guy, a little shepherd out, the youngest of the family and everything. And, and when, when Samuel saw uh, the eldest son of Jesse, David's father, he went, this is the one. And God said, no, he's not. And he didn't just say, no, he's not. He didn't just say, no, you missed that one. He tried to bring him on from there, and he said, Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Amen. Okay. Well, you don't always know a person's heart by just instantly meeting them. Yes? Yeah, um, I may have not heard what you said or what Shay said, but uh, as I was meditating on the scripture, mind does use the word love, and it connects knowledge and discernment. It uses the word and between knowledge and discernment. Yes. So the love, the selflessness is supposed to be with those two. Uh, it's not just love and the knowledge. And then, you know, your discernment could just be whatever. The spirit and nature of Christ is to be preeminent in those two areas. The way it's to be both of them. Amen. Uh, Mallory, didn't you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about judgments and how more in Bible school after we graduate because that's where you start finding out all this stuff. That's, that's good, yes. Another, another angle, um, whenever I see the word judgment, I think of the cross, so like, you know, the Absolutely. Well, and uh, when you said one of your words, yeah, uh, and, and you said pride, you know, the Bible says knowledge puffs up. Knowledge puffs up. No, and you, guess what? He's not talking about knowledge of the space program or of uh, brain surgery. He's talking about knowledge of the things of God. That's where the Pharisees came from. You know, the, the ones who attack Jesus regularly <laughs> because they thought they knew something, and they did. They knew all kind of stuff. It made them prideful, and the one thing that they didn't know was Jesus. Yes, Carolyn? Uh, Amen. Well said. Because it's, it's um, to, to search the scriptures is not to be on a fact-finding mission. It is to find the Lord. Yeah, Jim? It's interesting that the, the new American puts real knowledge. Oh, really? I like it. Craig?
most of us are taught to be sinful. So, you know, we become, we become Christians, and then the first thing we do is we're taught to focus on sin. And so we're, we're watching for sin and everybody else's sin. Yeah, that's exactly right. And at the same time, we're trying to make ourselves perfect. And when we achieve that, we look down on somebody else. Like, what's wrong? Our expectations are, what's wrong with you? Can't you get it right? Amen. Well, for those of you who couldn't pick up Greg on the uh, microphone, he just shared the whole eternal plan of God in a nutshell and how to live it. And it was really, really good. <clears throat> I'd tell you to get the tape, but you're probably listening to it now. <laughs> um, I. I think built within this, something Mallory said, I think it, something built within this, and it goes along with this reality, and that is uh, um, that we tend to judge according to what we know. And we, we don't, if it's an area we don't have any clue about, then we usually don't make definitive statements and say this is the way that it is, or da 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 da, because we don't know. Um, one of the things that, you know, by the grace of God and by the continual help of the Holy Spirit that the Father works in me is when someone brings up some sort of a problem or something, um, my first reaction is not to listen to my head and say, well, that can't be right. Um, you know, Proverbs, uh, Solomon said, the wisest man in the world said, Every man's way is, is, is right in his own eyes. Um, and, you know, if every man's way is right in his own eyes, then who's wrong? Well, every man but me. I mean, wouldn't that, wouldn't that make sense? And, uh, yeah, I'll get you in just a second. Um, and so there is this, there is this thing where... Um, I want to become sort of, I'm going to describe it like, let's say a sponge, but that's not a good way, that's not the best description at all, but where when things come, questions or criticisms or whatever, I want to take them in, not deep enough where they destroy me, you understand, you, you do understand that I hope, but not like a rock where it just bounces off of me, because what if that's God? You know, I mean, I, and I've had that happen so many times where someone you, you know, would never expect has come up from the Lord, but, you know, the last five times they spoke, well, it was foolishness, but this time it's the Lord, so you mark them off because the last time they spoke, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Golly, and miss the Lord? And, and miss God's messenger? I mean, anybody ever read the Old Testament prophets? You know, I don't want to do that. I want to be open enough. And, and like I said, it, it goes in enough where it doesn't just go in and eat my lunch if it's not true. It goes in enough where I have taken it and set it on the altar and said to the Father, show me the truth of this. And many times he said, well, this part wasn't right and this wasn't there, but this right here. And you go, Okay. But that means you want the Lord more than you want to be right. And that ain't easy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and if we ever see God's true judgment at the cross, I'm not talking about the doctrine of it, but if we ever see it, we know that anything but Christ is already condemned. And it opens you up a lot more <laughs> to, to go, okay, show me Jesus, because I don't even have to know if this is right or wrong right now. Even if they're totally wrong and got a bad spirit, I still need Jesus. You know. All right, let's uh, go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back.